Welcome. I'm Joel Rothstein. We are here with Mark Fisher, who is a Republican candidate for governor. Thank you for participating. Before we start, let's review the format of the interview. This will be a live to tape interview. That means no edits. Once we begin, there was no pre-screening of questions and answers will be limited to two minutes each. We will start with a one minute opening statement from the candidate and after the questions, we will conclude with a one minute closing statement. Mr. Fisher, you have one minute for an opening statement. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joel. My name is Mark Fisher. I'm a Republican and I'm running for governor. For far too long, Massachusetts has been owned by the Democrats. It's a one party state. But their liberal policies have doubled the number of food stamp recipients, tripled the cost of entitlement programs, and have forced businesses, people, and jobs out of Massachusetts and invited in illegal immigrants. This is not the right path. This is the road to Detroit, and I want to stop it. I want to do what Governor Scott Walker has done in Wisconsin. In three short years, he's taken tens of billions of dollars in deficits and turned it into a $1 billion surplus. I can do that in Massachusetts here, and I can do it with a simple, straightforward, common sense, four-point program to make Massachusetts business friendly. I would humbly ask for your vote in the September 9th Republican primary. Thank you. We will now proceed to the questions. Mr. Fisher, you have up to two minutes to answer each question. If elected, what are your priorities to serve the states best? First, Joel, um, it's an integrity issue. Uh, the government has made certain promises to Massachusetts citizens with regard to the tolls, that when the turnpike was paid for, the tolls would come down. I want to keep that promise. And I also want to keep the promises with regard to the income tax. We were told it was temporary when it increased above 5%. And the same thing with the sales tax when it was increased above 5%. I want to return those to 5% where we were promised they would be. And then secondly, I want to take care of some of the abuse and fraud in the EBT card system, um, with food stamps, and with uh, illegal immigration. In, in an official administration, illegal immigration will be illegal. And with my four-point uh, program to make Massachusetts business friendly, we will take people from the dole to the payroll, and as a result, tax revenues will go up and state coffers will be full to fund these programs. Now, my four-point program is this. Uh, we reduce the corporate tax rate to make it comparable with those states to which we're driving businesses uh, to. Secondly, we stop the taxpayer funding of fad industries like Evergreen Solar. 58 million taxpayer dollars were used to fund that company, and just two years after they received that money, they closed their doors, moved to China, and 800 people lost their jobs. I want to cut back on the overburdensome rules and regulations which drive people out. And then lastly, we have something in Massachusetts that about seven other states have. It's called an inventory tax. But it keeps distribution centers out of Massachusetts. They could take advantage of our central location. We serve all of New England and New York. By eliminating that, that tax, distribution centers would come here. Massachusetts would be a haven for distribution centers. And when they come, they would bring material handling jobs, logistics jobs, administrative jobs, and uh, transportation jobs, truck drivers in and out of Massachusetts. What do you think is the appropriate role of state government in dealing with the economy and job growth? What are the issues? What are the biggest issues facing the Massachusetts economy? And what policy priorities would you support to address them? Well, again, jobs. Uh, government doesn't create jobs, but they can drive businesses out of Massachusetts. Uh, I've worked for four companies. Actually, four of my previous employers in a row have closed their doors and not gone out of business. They've closed their doors and moved out of state. That's because Massachusetts is not very business friendly. Uh, surprisingly enough, Joel, uh, New York, liberal New York, is now second uh, among the states in job creation because they have tax incentives to bring businesses in. Uh, people get jobs, again, they come off the, pay the dole, go on to the payroll, and then income taxes fill the uh, state coffers. Uh, even, even President Kennedy, this is strange because in Massachusetts, you wouldn't think that uh, President Kennedy would be saying this, but he talked about raising revenues by cutting taxes, by giving money back to the people who then stimulate the economy. That's what I think the role of government here is in, uh, in not only Massachusetts, but uh, across the country. The Commonwealth's transportation infrastructure is critical to supporting our economy. What are your priorities for supporting the Commonwealth's infrastructure, and how would you fund these initiatives? Right. First things first, there are a number of uh, big projects on the table. I say before we do any big projects, we uh, stabilize our infrastructure by repairing bridges and roads. And we do that, how do we fund it? We do that by creating 
jobs here in Massachusetts, making it business friendly. And then again, the, the, the taxes that would flow into the coffers of state government would help uh, fund these programs. By the way, I think that the Massachusetts Turnpike is a great example of a self-sustaining transportation project. Uh, we were told when the Turnpike was built in the 50s that the tolls would come down when the Turnpike was paid for. The Turnpike has been paid for for about 30 years. All the uh, billboards that you see as you drive down the Turnpike, along with the rest stops and the food eateries and the gas stations, they generate enough revenue to pay for the annual maintenance on the Turnpike and then generate each and every year $20 uh, million dollars in surplus. This is the way we should do things in Massachusetts, have self-sustaining transportation projects. That's what I want to do as governor. What would you do about individuals with proper, without proper documentation in Massachusetts? What are the responsibilities of the state of Massachusetts, the individuals themselves, and the countries from which they come? Mm -hmm. Do you support providing services to individuals who are in Massachusetts without proper documentation? Well, that's a great question. It's a hot button uh, topic, especially right now. I've said this from the beginning uh, in December when I kicked off. Uh, under a Fisher administration, illegal immigration will be illegal. Um, we're compassionate people. But this is now turning into a, a capacity problem. We have in Massachusetts now over 200,000 uh, illegal immigrants, and it costs the taxpayers two billion, billion with a B, billion dollars each and every year. What does that mean to cities and towns? If you take that number and divide it by the 351 cities and towns in, this, in the state, that's over five million dollars in local aid that could be used for a number of things. Um, so here's what I say. I'm not about creating a new government bureaucracy and hiring people and trying to hunt down illegal immigrants and arresting them and put them in jail and hope that the federal government uh, would deport them. That's not my solution at all. I want to do what Governor uh, LePage in Maine is doing. Um, they come to Massachusetts because of the benefits. Uh, Massachusetts gives out more benefits to illegal immigrants than all of the other New England states combined. Combined. They're only illegal. They're not stupid. So what do we do? We cut off the benefits. We use E-Verify, which is a, a tool that employers can use to verify the immigration status of employees. We mandate it in the state. Only about 17 states have it, have it mandated. And uh, we turn off the benefits. Uh, when we do that, illegal immigrants won't self-deport to their home countries, but they will self-deport to the next big sanctuary state, be it New York or California or wherever, and then our cities and towns can get back to being functional again. I know the mayor of, uh, of uh, Lynn, Judy Kennedy, is talking about the overwhelming burden, burden this is placing on services and schools. Uh, like I said, we already have over 200,000 here. It's time to address the problem and uh, make sure that Massachusetts doesn't uh, further limit the uh, successful functioning of its cities and towns. Good. What roles and responsibilities do federal, state, and local entities have uh, in addressing the energy policy? Are there circumstances in which federal policy should supersede state and local concerns? Mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts has some of the highest energy costs uh, in the country. Uh, we need to look for uh, lower uh, sources, uh, uh, lower cost sources, uh, sources of energy. Um, like I said earlier, uh, I'm not for the fad funding of certain energy products like Evergreen Solar and also Cape Wind. Uh, going to renewable energy is a great thing, but the costs associated with it have to be considered as well. And uh, Cape Wind uh, is not going to generate lower costs here. And again, it will drive businesses out along with uh, people and jobs. This is not the right direction for Massachusetts. One thing that I am interested in is um, the proposed uh, new gas line, a new gas line, because we have existing ones as well. Uh, natural gas is a low-cost uh, source of energy. I think it's a great uh, way to go for Massachusetts. However, we have to balance that with the concerns of citizens. There's a lot of people in the communities where this new gas line, proposed gas line, would, would go through, and they have concerns, and they feel like they haven't been heard yet. So uh, we have to balance those two things together. And what you mentioned about local, uh, state, and federal working together, I agree. I think federal sometimes should supersede. Uh, I don't know specifically when and how, but we all have to work together. And we can't please all the people all the time. But that's the part of uh, working for the common good, and working for the majority of people. And um, each and every issue has to be looked at uh, individually and see how those three uh, sources of government uh, play out and work to the best of all of us. Okay. What role does state have does the state have in reducing the achievement gap 
if you do think the state government has a role, mm -hmm. what policy priorities would you support to reduce the achievement gap? I think the state has a great role to play. I think uh, public education uh, is one of the, the, the high priorities for the, for the state. And here's what I would say, Joel. Uh, I'm, I'm against Common Core because I don't think it uh, allows teachers to teach in the classroom. It's a federal imposed program. But more to the achievement gap, uh, I run a small business, have just seven employees, but it's manufacturing. And what we're finding is students aren't coming prepared with some basic math and, and science skills. Uh, myself and a few other employers have developed a one-page test, at basically fourth grade math, to see where, where uh, incoming uh, employees stand. Uh, what I would do is this. When I went to school in the, in the uh, junior high school, now it's called middle school, we had a wood shop and metal shop and home e economics and uh, vocational skill programs. A lot of that has gone by the wayside. It's not included anymore because we're teaching to the test or we have time on task. I would want to reintroduce those things so that students can understand that success doesn't only come through a college education and all the debt that goes along with it. And Joel, I think one of the great joys in life is finding out um, what skills and talents we have uh, what we like to do, what we do best, and then stepping forward and testing the waters. And what better way uh, for young students to find out what those skills are by introducing them to a broader range of things, like I said, wood shop, metal shop, vocational skill programs. And if that's what they want to do, then perhaps success for them isn't uh, a college education. Maybe it's a vocational school to become an electrician, a plumber, uh, a mechanic, a welder, so forth and so on. These are good paying jobs. Uh, one quick story. I went to look for six machinists a number of years ago uh, to Worcester Trade School. There was only one junior in the program. No freshmen, no sophomores, no seniors. Just one junior in the machining program at Worcester Trade School because we've been pushing kids to college. I think we need to uh, re-examine that and put in programs in the middle school that would help kids to see if they have those types of skills. Okay. Do you support changes to the Chapter 70 education funding formula, including changes in the foundation budget, if you do support changes, what changes would you like to see and why? If you don't support changes, why? <laughs> I do support changes. Um, I know that uh, Harvard University recommended just what you were talking mm -hmm. about a number of years ago, and these baselines have never been reset. Uh, so we have some cities and towns that are getting a disproportional amount of money and others aren't. I think we need to level the playing field by looking at uh, re-examining all of those things across the board, as Harvard suggested uh, many years ago. I'm not sure why the log jam up at, at Biggin Hill is preventing this, but uh, I'm, I'm for uh, local cities and towns advocating for this type of reform, and I think it would help out the greater um, numbers of cities and towns in the Commonwealth that need this funds, that need these funds. Okay. Please give us one example of an issue that you and your opponents agree upon, and two examples of issues in which you and your opponents differ, mm -hmm. and why your position represents the best interests for the Commonwealth. Right. Well, it's, it's a hard one to find out things that we agree on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start with the things we disagree on. First one is uh, illegal immigration. Um, my Republican opponent agrees with uh, my Democratic opponents that uh, Deval Patrick has the right idea by bringing in now an additional um, unaccompanied minors in, a, in addition to over 200,000 that we have already. I say no. Um, this is a federal problem that should be dealt with at the federal level. And um, we're compassionate people, but this is a capacity problem now. Things are being dysfunctional. Um, we also don't agree on the no, no new taxes. Governor Deval Patrick has raised uh, taxes by $1.3 billion. Uh, we don't have a revenue problem. We have an enormous spending problem. So those are two things that we disagree on. Uh, again, even my Republican opponent refuses to take the no new tax pledge which uh, Governor Weld has taken, uh, Governor Paul Salucci took repeatedly and was proud to do it. I've taken it. Uh, those are those two issues that we disagree upon. Things that we do agree upon, that's a good one. Um, I think we all agree that uh, jobs are a good thing for Massachusetts. I outlined my four-point program. I haven't heard the details of any of the other, other candidates. They talk about that, but the, how they're going to achieve them, I'm not quite sure. And uh, I'd be hard pressed to find the second thing that we agree upon, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's only asking for one, so you're okay. <laughs> what strategies would you use for working with members of other parties, with others of opposing views? Mm. And what experience do you have in implementing these types of strategies? Mm. 
That's a great question, and uh, it's very uh, pertinent because uh, if the voters were elect me, I would be a Republican governor working with an overwhelming majority of Democrats. Uh, for example, in the Senate, we have 40 senators, 36 out of 40 are Democrats. Uh, in the House, we have 160 uh, representatives, and 130 or 131 are Democrats. So people want to know, how are you going to govern? Here's my answer. Uh, as I said in my opening, the Democrats have owned the state for a long, long time. Um, they've had their chance. Uh, what I want to do is this, Joel. I, if, if the voters elect me, then I want to work with them. Uh, rather than reach across the aisle and work with the Democrats, I'm going to reach across Beacon Hill, work with common men and women who elected me, bring their ideas and their concerns to Beacon Hill. And if the other side, the Democrats, want to work with people as opposed to working against them, then by definition, we'll be working together. But here's, my, here's the difference. If they don't do that, if they don't do that, then I'm going to point them out. I'm going to call them out, list them by name against the programs that the people want and they're against so that they can be voted out. That's, that's how I would govern on Beacon Hill. <laughs> Mr. Fisher, you have one minute for a closing statement. Very good. Thank you. Um, again, I'm a Republican uh, in a blue state of Massachusetts. Every now and then, the voters of Massachusetts realize that there are tipping points and they've elected Republican governors. I think that this is another one of those times. Um, as I said earlier, businesses, people, and jobs are leaving Massachusetts. They're actually being driven out by liberal policies. I want to change those policies. I want to make Massachusetts business friendly, invite businesses back to Massachusetts so people can get back to work, and that we can increase the coffers of state government through the taxes they would pay through the income tax and fund the programs that needed to be funded for education and so forth that aren't being funded right now, that are being cut. Um, I want to balance the state budget. Uh, we're over uh, 120 million, billion dollars in debt. I can do what Governor Scott Walker has done in Wisconsin. I said earlier, uh, in th just three short years, he was able to take tens of billion dollars in deficits and turn it into a surplus. I can do that here in Massachusetts. I appreciate your chance for a vote on the September 9th Republican primary. We want to thank Mr. Fisher for participating in our conversation. Please make your voice count by voting at the state primary on September 9th, 2014. For Arlington Public News, this is Joel Rothstein. Thank you.